All right, we're going to be kicking off the first of our normal talks today, right now, in track one. Uh, John Strohshine is here, who's going to be speaking about following a trail of confusion. So please welcome him to the TourCon stage. All right. Uh, well, thank you. Uh, and thank you to Tim and, and David and all of the TorCon crew that uh, put this on and uh, allowed me to come and speak to you for about 50 minutes. Uh, I definitely will do my best to keep it to that uh, timeline because I know now I'm going into some of the lunch period. Uh, so I, I titled this uh, calling, uh, this, this presentation, I titled it uh, Following a Trail of Confusion because uh, it seemed the most appropriate title for what I want to talk about. And, and part of what I do on a, on a somewhat regular basis is to look at malware and try to understand its behaviors, its intents, some of the tricks that it employs. And that's usually what I end up doing, is trying to solve these puzzles and, and try to identify these obfuscation techniques so that I can unwind them so that I can see what that malware is actually up to. And then I can provide uh, intelligence indicators, uh, reports, summaries to whoever is asking me to do this work. Um, or in some cases, uh, making some training material. So uh, my contact information, that's my email. If there's anything from this presentation that uh, you'd like me to provide you, send you the slides. I think they'll be available after the talk. Um, questions on the samples. I'll talk about some plugins that uh, I didn't link to and I don't even think I've got up on GitHub yet. Uh, but if I can send those to you as well, please feel free to contact me at my email account. Um, I'm here uh, representing quite a few different uh, organizations and, and places that I work. Uh, first and foremost, BDA Labs. Uh, which is with Jared DeMott, and uh, we also do training. So I was fortunate to be here earlier this week and did a couple days on uh, malware. So uh, I think I saw a couple of familiar faces here earlier. Uh, we both also, also author at Pluralsight. Uh, I work with OISF, I work with Bromium, and then I teach full-time at a university in the Midwest. So the basic flow uh, is that we're going to start with these delivery mechanisms, whether it's an office document or uh, a spear phishing link or some other content, but some sort of a delivery mechanism. Uh, we're going to begin in this talk with the office doc and that those office documents then will employ some sort of method to get code to execute. Oftentimes that's through macros. So the idea is that there's multiple stages and that these stages continue to unravel. Maybe we then go to a batch script or some PowerShell. Maybe we get some shell code. Uh, eventually, we, we, we gen, generally tend to get to some native code, so a PE file, maybe some .NET, maybe some Java. That's the actual payload that the malware authors wanted to drop before we then move into this post-infection uh, you know, post phase. So at each stage, there is generally some layers or multiple layers of obfusca obfuscation. And depending on the type of code that we're looking at, we'll also then greatly determine the type of obfuscation that we'll see. Uh, towards the outer end of that, the beginnings of the attack, there's a little less effort, just in my experience, in uh, making those you know, armored bulletproof documents. Um, and we're also dealing typically with, with interpreted code. And so the, the level of obfuscation techniques that are available to an author are maybe a little bit more limited than when we move a little bit deeper, get a little bit closer to that payload, and now we're dealing with shell code, we're dealing with PE files in which it's a little bit more difficult just in general to reverse engineer those, um, and also to detect any sort of obfuscation or anti-analysis. So there are many ways we could go about this. Uh, I'm going to focus on if we were going to analyze each stage. I'm not saying that that's necessarily the step that you have to take in each stage. If I wanted to observe the behavior of an office doc, um, I might go to a sandbox before I decide to dump the macros and investigate those. But for the purposes of this talk, we're going to dig into those. So our first document is this Hanseter Maldoc. Uh, with each sample that we're going to talk about today, I'm going to have the MD5s there. So if you want to grab a sample, you'll be able to pull those down from virus total intelligence or maybe hybrid analysis or your own internal pool um, so that you have that as a reference. Uh, we're not going to go through all the analysis. I'm just going to focus on a specific technique that I observed in that document or that, that, you know, that piece of software, that script, uh, that highlights or exemplifies some of the, you know, the obfuscation that I see. Um, with this one, so it's an Office document, so my go-to tool is OLE Dump. That's a, a Python script made by Didier Stevens. And what that allows us to do, as you can see in the screenshot, and, and hopefully everyone can see this one okay. It might be a little bit hard the further back you get. Uh, is it essentially gives us the table of contents of that document. So we can see indexes, those are the numbers off to the left. Then you can see the contents, the streams, and some directories, what is all stored in this document itself. And then the most significant thing, or at least the most important for this analysis, is that we have the streams that are identified with macros. So in this case, it's 8 and 10. And we know that because there's a capital M next to those streams. So we can use the tool in order to extract those. 
Um, that allows us to decompress that macro code and begin investigating the VBA, the Visual Basic for Applications. Um, another thing that I've run across with Office documents, and this one took me a little bit of time to really piece together, was the, these streams right here, 17 and 18 for this document. Of course, the document structure will change what streams you identify here, so this is the structure for this particular doc. Uh, but this one has F and O, and what those actually represent are a user form. So this means that within this document, there's a user form, and the user form generally will contain very basic objects, labels, buttons, text boxes, that you can then embed content into, shellcode, PE files, uh, obfuscated strings, PowerShell scripts, whatever it happens to be. So seeing those referenced in the macro code isn't always the most direct or the most obvious. And one of the tools that I use very often if I really need to actually look into any particular user form is to actually use the Office IDE, the integrated development environment, because then you can, you can open up the project kind of like you would in Visual Studio. You can see the macros, you can also see the forms, you can get the, uh, the, the controls on the forms as well. Uh, now, that's not always the case. Uh, oftentimes, in a trick that you'll see really throughout all of the obfuscation efforts is to try to identify what obfuscation is being used, when is it being deobfuscated or, or decrypted, catch it at that point, let the malware do all the work for you. And um, so it's very rare that I actually pull that raw content off of a form because I just try to figure out where in the code it's being deobfuscated so I can grab it right there. Um, you start looking at VBA code. So let's say you have to dig a little bit deeper into this document. And you're going to find, and you'll see this across a lot of interpreted languages, JavaScript and PHP, and that there's only a, a limited number of ways in which you can really obfuscate this code. You can create very you know, random and, and seemingly strange looking variable names and function names. This just simply makes it harder to trace the logic. Um, so here's an example. We have function permanent and object parakeet. Uh, we have strings and strings and APIs. So strings and function calls are, are generally the most important thing that I'm looking for when I'm trying to analyze any form, any sort of, of malicious content or any program at all, even if it's not malicious. Uh, what are the strings being used? What are the functions being called? Um, so with this one, uh, again, very common to see, just enough string obfuscation to make it that you can't readily recognize what those strings are so that they can be dynamically reconstructed during runtime and used just at the point that the malware authors actually need it. So this one has some string reversal and some substrings, and that's how it's simply recreating those strings. So using those string manipulation methods on either the string itself or a subcomponent of a string and then rebuilding that string as it goes. Another technique very common across the board is uh, also junk instructions. And again, my opinion is that it's a little bit easier to identify these when we're looking at interpreted code. Uh, I can see three variables here. They're doing some very basic math. And each one of those variables I could highlight, I could do a find in the document, and I could quickly determine if they're being used or not. If they're not being used, then I got a pretty good indication that it's just junk code. So oftentimes the case there is you get into native code and you start disassembling things with IDA or Binary Ninja or some other tool, um, it, at least for me, it's a little bit more difficult to recognize those because you're looking at disassembly. So you have to do more program analysis before you can determine if it's a junk instruction or not. Uh, you might have some control structures and even those control structures might look like they're doing something with string manipulation, so it might look like it's important, but again, it's not. It's just there to slow you down if you're actually analyzing these. And the last thing on this one, the last, that bladder pot, which is a great variable name, that's actually a legitimate string. And you can see that by looking at the content uh, from Win32. It's just reverse from Win32, and then there's a substring select star. So there, it's going to be from Win32 space star. So that's the only legitimate string here. So we could identify that variable and start tracing it through the macros if we needed to. Um, another technique is to use the Windows API. So the Windows API is important. We're going to, any program that's going to run in the operating system, the Windows operating system is going to eventually interface through the Windows API. And some environments will allow you to do that directly. So VBA macros are actually no different. You can, in fact, call directly into the Windows API from your VBA macros. So normally you would use the functions that are defined in the language, and those are documented on MSDN as well, the Microsoft Developer Network. Uh, but you can also directly call. So here's an example. Uh, all the, the green, those are comments, so the authors in this case decided to take and, and interject all of these lyrics from songs in between these aliases that they're creating, and these aliases are allowing them to call things like virtual alloc out of kernel 32, which is our memory allocation routine, and RTL move memory, which is um, coming out of NTDLL. If we need to identify the usage of those APIs, then you have to look off to the, kind of to the left there, 
and that virtual alloc is going to be aliased with betterment, and our tail move memory is this uh, variable antecedency. So in order to identify their usage in the macros now, you either need to just rename them and refactor that code if you've extracted it and you're working with this in a text editor, um, or just keep that mental mapping in mind. So if I'm spending some time here, I'm usually renaming things as I go, because it doesn't take very long to just do a find replace. Now, this one and this document is actually using shellcode. So shellcode is embedded in a user form. The macros begin to execute. It used virtual alloc to allocate some memory. It then used the RTL move memory API in order to copy that shellcode from that user form after it decrypted it or deobfuscated it into the allocation that it just made. So logically, we can think about if we're going to have shellcoded memory, it needs to be staged there. So we need to allocate the memory. We need to copy it into memory. And then we need to execute it. And so there's a final API in this particular example um, that if you go back here, this was, I believe, all of them. One of these APIs has to be responsible for executing the code. Now, uh, it doesn't jump out immediately as an obvious API. At least it didn't for me the first time I looked at it. However, if I followed or traced those API calls, I found the allocation, I found the copy, then the only other API that was being called was this cabriolet. And this one, you'll see here in just a moment, uh, is actually a function called enum dates format. And so what I decided to use is to use a debugger. So I oftentimes find myself using a, you know, a combination of static and dynamic analysis. And in this case, I felt it was easier to just set a breakpoint on this function call and then observe the behavior at the time that the code stopped. This allowed me to not only see the memory that was allocated, but because we're about to go execute code there, that shell code has to be in a deobfuscated form. So I uh, set a breakpoint. We can see that uh, Cabriolet is our enum dates formats enum date formats W, and this actually, as defined on MSDN, takes the first argument, which is a pointer to an application defined callback. So then it became clear, obvious to me, how exactly it was getting this code in memory to execute from within those macros. So continuing with that dynamic analysis, I uh, was able to, because it was running, I had runtime analysis, uh, I could look at the value of that first variable, I could dump the contents, so it was base 10, convert it quick to base 16, and you can look at the process memory. This is an office document, so winword.exe, and we can see that at the base of this allocation, we have RWX, which of course we would need execute permissions in that region of memory in order to execute the shell code. So from there, I used Process Hacker. I like Process Hacker because it allows me to see memory. Um, I was able to look at this. This really amounts to the entry point. So, so not only did this allow me to identify the shell code, pull it out of memory when it was deobfuscated, but it also allowed me to identify the entry point, which is another important step. If you don't have a, a specific point to start analyzing some code, you should probably start at start. Um, if I took all of this out of memory, you can see that we're at an offset. The base of the allocation is 70D000, but we're actually at an offset of E5D. So if I dump that out of memory and started disassembling from the first byte, you might get incorrect disassembly results. So I'm going to take my disassembler, Ida Pro or Binary Ninja, and I can point it to the entry point, which is this first byte right here, and that's a push EBP, the opcode 55. So seeing that in memory, recognizing that opcode to me was a good thing. Um, there are, I'm going to go kind of fast because there's a lot of stuff I want to have here. So if it seems like I'm just chugging through, I, I, I am. Uh, that night, I drank a big thing of caffeine before I got up here. Um, what's that? Yeah. Um, so embedding content. Uh, another, uh, this is an example. Uh, there's our OLE dump content. You can see F and zero. This project view below, that's actually from the office IDE. And so not only can you see the macro streams, this document, and Cowkeeper, another name that I use oftentimes when I develop, uh, but we can see the form as well. This form has a name, it's called Discord. You can look at the form and you'll see all the content on the form. Not only will you see the content, but if you select any of those objects, you can get the name of that object. And what this helped me connect the dots on was that when I'm looking at macro code, you may find at times these, these objects being referenced, but it's not clear exactly where they're coming from because a tool like OLE dump isn't going to give you the structure of the form and the objects within it. It's just going to simply say, hey, there's a, potentially there's a form here. Um, the IDE allows me to see that, oh, this is in fact an object on that form. So that at least helped me uh, connect those dots. So it was an important step in my analysis and looking at office documents, which I tend to see quite a few of. Um, 
Another document I ran across uh, not too long ago was uh, another office doc that has exhibited anti-analysis. So there's a, a variety of techniques of, in which the authors will try to employ detection of a virtual or analysis environment so that it can disrupt its behavior, disrupt your tools, disrupt the output. Uh, this particular document, again, I did, just did some runtime analysis because I didn't want to have to bother with trying to piece together all these strings. Um, and with this one, it had this array of values, KVM, QEMU, Red Hat, Virtual VMware, Xen, and it was looking for the manufacturer and the model of the host system. And so then it would take those values from the value it returned or obtained from the host and do some simple string comparison. If it determined any of these matched, then it said, I'm in a, I'm in a sandbox environment, and it would really abort its behavior. If it didn't detect, it would do one more check. And this one, as you can see by the same string box up above, uh, was using names of common analysis tools. So using Win32, or I'm sorry, the Win Management WMI, it gets a current listing of processes, compares it to these hard-coded strings, process names, if anything matches again. Two checks in order to, uh, to deviate or, or modify its behavior. Right, and Office Documents aren't the only one that does that technique. I, I see it across the board. I see a lot in native code. And one of the first things that native code will do is use Create Tool Help 32 Snapshot, a Windows API, to get a process listing, go through those processes and see if there's any um, known processes that are running that would indicate that it's being analyzed or debugged so that it can abort or, or change its behavior. Uh, it's not uncommon to run across password or documents that are actually password protected. Um, in this particular case, I got a document, but I, when I went to analyze it, um, because it's password protected, the macros are encrypted. So you can't use a tool like Oli Dump to extract those. So I really needed to see for a variety of reasons what was going on here, and I didn't have the original email that it was sent to, so I didn't have the password. Now, if these passwords are getting sent to users, that means that those passwords are typically pretty simple, four-digit pins. I saw a lot of documents at the time that just had four-digit pins. And so uh, in doing a little bit of, of digging, discovered that John the Ripper actually has a Python script, Office to John, that will extract that hash, put it into a format that you can then feed into John, and begin doing some brute forcing. So in this case, I told John to just incrementally go through the digits until it found a password. And after actually a few minutes in a one core CPU VM, um, I had the password to my document, which was 455. So then I could open the doc, I could extract the macros, I could actually remove the password altogether um, and continue my analysis. So I mentioned shellcode. I actually like to talk about shellcode very early on because it's used, and I see it throughout really all phases of the different attack stages that I see. We have saw it in VBA. I've seen it in PowerShell. You'll see it in native code. It's really um, a very efficient, or I should say effective way uh, to, to you know, contain some functionality into whatever vehicle you're using to attack or you're seeing that is being used for attack. So oftentimes seen in, in malicious code, uh, those things there. Uh, I see it used for unpacking, and we'll go through an example here in just a little bit, and how the shell code is used in a very modular form in order to do some unpacking so that the original functionality of whatever that pack sample was can then execute. Shell code, once you've identified the usage, just like you saw with the VBA document, then we just need to extract it from memory, and because it is likely native code, we can use some tool like Ida Pro or Binary Ninja in order to disassemble that. So this is an example, that shell code that you saw earlier, this is actually disassembly from that. And uh, of course I chose a select part of that disassembly here to, to talk through. Um, there's lots of differences or nuances with shell code as far as, it, as how it uh, differentiates between a normal executable file that you give to the operating system and loads it through the operating system loader into memory and, and prepares it for execution. One of those main things is how it calls or imports functionality. So if we're going to interact with the Windows OS, we're going to use the Windows API. And if we're going to do that, we're going to import that functionality. So the operating system will take care of that for us in a normal situation. Shellcode is not normal. It's put into memory, and then we're just telling the CPU to go to some location in that shellcode and begin executing. So the shellcode is responsible, amongst other things, for ensuring that it has built its own import table. So you see artifacts of that or evidence of that when you look at the shellcode because you'll see calls. Instead of you know, call create process or call virtual alloc, you see call EBP plus var 1b0, kind of a non-standard way of calling a function. There's a function pointer inside of that local variable. It's a local variable because we're referencing EBP, and we're also assuming, or we have analyzed this to know that this function has a normal stack frame. 
Um, and it, so it's calling it through a local variable, which again, you can do, if you write code, you can actually do that, but it's not the normal way. Um, for our analysis though, we have to figure out what is that call? I said strings and APIs are important, and if I don't know what that API is, I don't know what that call is, I'm kind of blinded to what the program is actually doing. So in this example, there's two instances of it. This one uses a really well-known technique. So even though it's well-known, it's still something that I really regularly encounter, and that it has stack strings. So it's just taking the variable for those ASCII characters, or the, the data, the numeric values for those ASCII characters, and it's moving them into the stack. So it's constructing that string on the stack at the time that it needs it, so that then it can dynamically resolve our call to whatever function it's after. So in this example, it's going to call ZW unmap view of section. So there's our stack variable. The BL is our null byte. It was XORed up above, so that's just terminating the string. The other thing that this shows us, if you looked at the sample in its entirety, is this trend or this pattern of string function call result. Results are going to be returned in EAX in this example. Um, that being moved into our local variable. And, and of course, because I've made these screenshots, that local variable is right here. So this also tells us that once we recognize this pattern, that our call to sub CF1, that is likely resolving these APIs for us. So if you have to figure out how that works, you can trace into it. If not, you just maybe rename it and you're happy with the fact that you know that anywhere this is being called, it's likely resolving a function for you. The sample does, um, Process hollowing, so really there's another layer that we'd have to trace into if we were to continue to analyze it. So what you're seeing in that shell code is the fact that it's going to start a process in a suspended state. It's gonna empty out or replace the original code. So it's gonna use probably a binary, a well-known binary on the system, like explorer.exe or uh, SVC host or anything that it can think of. Since it's loading that executable in a suspended state, it looks like it's coming from that original location. You know, so C system 32 SVC host.exe but it's suspended. So it can use some of the other APIs like unmap view of section in order to get a pointer to that text section to then replace it with its own code. So now another round of or, or stage of shell codes getting injected into that memory. Um, and once it's replaced, it updates the entry point and resumes execution. So if we wanted to continue to debug that, we would just have to recognize that pattern, which is why it's important to find those APIs and then continue to trace in. You might also be able to recognize signatures, arguments that are being pushed onto the stack for that call. So even if you don't recognize, because you can't, because this is call to this location that we can't see, um, you might be able to recognize some of the arguments and still identify the API that's being used. That doesn't really scale all that well, but sometimes if you're just doing some quick analysis, it, it can help. Um, this one I called a common dropper and it is a common dropper and that it contains very limited functionality. It's just simply trying to go out to some C2 node that is now long dead and download the next stage. What's interesting about this one is that it exhibits that same behavior that we're, we're starting to discuss with the shell code, but in a normal full PE executable file format. So you do some analysis, right? Typically I start by doing some basic things. If it's a PE file, I'll use something like PE Studio, look at the imports, look at the libraries, look at the strings to try to understand a little bit about the file. Is it, is it gonna be employing obfuscation? Is it gonna be employ, is it gonna be packed? Do I need to unpack it first? Um, and some of those characteristics of the file will then just jump out. This one has no libraries, no imports, and even though I've, I've significantly snipped the strings, it really had no strings, just strings from a normal PE file. So that tells me that, yeah, it's dynamically resolved, resolving its imports, it's probably dynamically resolving strings. They're hidden in there somewhere, or it's not even using them, which is actually the case here with this sample. Um, you can disassemble, right? It's still a valid PE file. So if I need to take to disassembly to start trying to get a sense of the code, then in this case, I did that, uh, and here's a call EAX, right? So what is, what is EAX? Uh, you can trace above and see that there's a push and then a pop and then a call. So we know that whatever this D word is here, that's actually what's being called, but that value is populated at runtime. So you navigate to that now in IDA or BN and you're gonna see that it's a zero value, right? So it's runtime dynamically resolving those. Uh, again, a lot of different approaches. Maybe I just jump to a debugger, IDA Pro has an integrated debugger, set a breakpoint, once I hit that call, that indirect call site, the debugger will likely tell me exactly what's being called there. Uh, but again, this doesn't really scale well. You can script it, you could script every indirect call site so that uh, IDA could possibly populate those values for you. Again, a lot of ways you could do that. 
Um, or you could actually get in and analyze the code, which is what I did here. Uh, this technique, we could spend an hour on alone, so I just wanted to give you the high-level overview uh, in that this is a basic block. So if you've ever looked at IDA and a function graph in IDA, you have all those blocks, right? Those basic, this is a basic block. This is the first basic block in the program, and it exemplifies the problem in that we have a, an indirect call, and we have two calls before that. And so what we can determine from, from looking at that is that those two calls have to be responsible for populating this. Um, jumping into each one, they each have a very specific purpose. The first one will then locate in memory the DLL that we're going to get an API from. So it passes this hash value, which it then calculates in the function based off of the DLL that it's trying to find. So it's going through all of the DLLs in memory character by character, creating that same checksum or hash value and then comparing it to this. So it's avoiding strings as it's trying to find the DLL that we're after. Um, once it identifies that, it returns the image base for that library, and then this next function takes an array of basically the same hash values, the exports that it's after, it parses the PE file and builds an import table. So once that import table is constructed, then our program can go ahead and start making function calls. Right? It could be a little bit more discrete, it could do it an individual API at a time. In this case, it constructs them per DLL at a time, so it's a little bit more noisy, a little bit more obvious once you recognize the pattern. Uh, for the sake of time, I'll just really quick highlight kind of the overall flow here. Uh, I wanted this in here more as a reference, just in case you were curious, I wanted to look at the slides. Uh, you can see the flow, this is the flow of the DLL. So it's using the PEB, the process environment block, and you can recognize that usage uh, at the very top here, uh, FS30 hex. So it's using the FS register to get the PEB, the, pe the process environment block. This allows the program to, to, to navigate these somewhat undocumented structures in the process to get a doubly linked list of all the DLLs that are in memory. And once it determines the match, it can get the base of that DLL, and then we can parse the PE file from there. That's what this next function is doing, and that's the, the basic flow here. So calculating those hashes after it's found the export table of the PE file, comparing those to the hashes that it has hard-coded, and then if it finds a match, gets that function address, and then builds an array of function pointers. Right. So what do we do with this, this technique? In this example, um, I actually created a, an IDA plugin and a Binary Ninja one for that matter, and uh, actually made it go through the database and essentially perform the same logic without having to do runtime analysis. So it went through, it populated all of those, those call sites that we saw that, well, I won't back up now, but at the very beginning and added a comment to rename them with the actual API. So now I could just go through the database and I could actually see the functions that were being called. So uh, detecting packing, um, I really bias my analysis at this point and that I just assume everything I'm going to look at is going to have some layer of packing and I'm going to have to do some work to unpack it. You have to unpack something because if you want to analyze the functionality, you have to get it out of whatever it's packed into. If you don't do that, then you're analyzing the unpacking code. So probably not of interest to you unless you're just curious on how it actually is unpacking. Uh, lots of different ways you can do this. Looking at entropy in the sections, looking at entropy in the file, looking at things like strings and imports as we've already discussed, um, and that can give you some evidence. Uh, typically there's no one key piece of information that says 100% this is packed. It's usually for me, it's looking at a variety of different characteristics or maybe features of that file in order to detect that. Um, you may open it up in IDA and just get a feel for the functionality itself, looking at how many functions are there, looking at how complex the functions appear to be, and that can also just, you know, you look at enough of it, you, you just kind of get a sense of whether something's packed or not by looking at the disassembly. Um, I've got a variety of ways in which I've been able to unpack things. Uh, one of the simpler and, and one that I prefer whenever I possibly can is just to maybe watch memory allocations. So this sample here was a Tesla crypt, and what it would do is it would allocate memory two or three or four times, and as it was after those allocations, um, if you just let it run for a while, then you could look back in those allocations and you would eventually find a PE file. So the unpacking here was an entirely new PE file that it pulled out into memory and then began executing. Uh, you can use tools like WinDebug or whatever debugger you prefer. Um, I use WinDebug, so I'm, I'm prepared for jeers and, and tomatoes to be thrown at me. Uh, but I like it, I think it's a good debugger, uh, at least for what I use it for. And commands like this simply allow me to search the process, the address space, the memory of that process to find strings like the DOS stub. Uh, 
right? And then I'm just limiting the range that I'm looking at so that I'm not looking at PE files up in the, where the DLLs typically get loaded. This is what it looked like before. Limited functionality, although it's kind of hard to see. Um, kind of strange entry point with the program uh, and no real discernible strings. And then once it was pulled out of memory, I had very discernible strings, base64 encoded data, things like shadow copy and delete, and more complex entry point, DLL, or when main was identified, uh, and, and things that just made me feel much more confident that the sample was in fact unpacked. Okay, um, here's an example of Drydex. This one, that technique did not work on because essentially what, what this sample is doing is it's using several rounds of shell code in order to uh, begin the unpacking process. And ultimately, it's, it's doing a, a, a uh, I forget the name of the term now, uh, but it's gonna replace the code in the main program when it starts with this unpacked code. So it's gonna allocate some shell code, jump to the shell code, the shell code's gonna replace the original code. Once that's replaced, it's gonna jump back. So it's a little bit harder to trace through that. Um, you also don't have a blatantly obvious PE file in memory once it's all done. Uh, the way that I attack that or begin determining how to trace that functionality, and I've been able to do this technique with a, a lot of different pack samples, is just look for um, abnormal behavior. And, and by abnormal behavior, I mean uh, conditional jumps into dynamic locations, maybe an indirect jump into a register or a global variable that's gonna get populated after the code is executing. This one begins, there's an LEA and EAX, this subroutine, it then pushes and then rets. So pushing before you ret means that you're pushing on whatever your return instruction is gonna to return to. Uh, again, kind of odd, normal functions don't do that. So in this case though, we have the function, so we can trace into that. And after analyzing that function, uh, again, I look at the context of it and I don't wanna get lost in the weeds. I don't wanna to have to go through every single disassembly instruction. So what I, what I, what I generally consider is that if this is doing some unpacking, then it's probably gonna begin by allocating some memory. It's probably then gonna copy stuff into memory, probably deobfuscating it along the way. And when it's done, it's going to transfer control to whatever it just deobfuscated or the shell code that it just created. So I take the function graph, I go to the bottom. Uh, this one, there really wasn't much there other than this call. So if you disassemble this, you'll see what I'm talking about. Um, this call right here is calling a D word. And again, this value is being populated dynamically during runtime. So statically, you can't just double click on that and see that value. Set a breakpoint, see the value, trace into it. It happens to have gone to this location, 40AFE0. This is an already disassembled function, right? It just was some, for some reason being dynamically populated in that global. So you might be able to go back to IDA and find that function. So now I can trace, trace the program a little bit further. Uh, same thing here though. Looking at the function in its entirety, don't want to get lost in the weeds or the details. Um, so I eventually see towards the end that there's another call to a local variable. So something that we saw earlier with that, uh, that uh, shell code. Set a breakpoint here, and this is calling into this location. Right? And seeing this in memory now, we can identify that this is an address that is not at the normal image base of our program, and so it must have been from a memory allocation, it must be shell code. Not only do we see this allocation, it's unpacked, we can pull this out of memory, and we know where the entry point is because we just followed the call to this location. So taking that shell code out of memory, again, I didn't spend a lot of time looking at what all of the shell code was doing. I started tracing down to the bottom of the shell code until I found this jump EAX. So we're jumping to whatever EAX is. In this case, it took me to this location, 401A40. So it took me back to the address space from where that original program began executing. So that was interesting. Um, it helped me confirm that I was at the point where it was unpacked. I went ahead and I compared the location and the instructions that were there in memory versus what was originally there when I disassembled it. And I saw that they were different instructions, so now I know I'm at the entry point of this unpacked code. So now I can begin doing some analysis. So I didn't have to get lost in the weeds. You could do this in this sample. It just takes a couple of minutes, really. Um, and it, it gets you into the inner workings of whatever is packed inside here. Uh, smoke loader is another example. There's the MD5. Um, sometimes you're gonna be able to detect packing with tools that will apply signatures and be able to identify well-known packing routines. PE Compact 2, then there's tools that can help you oops, unpack that, and then that can take you to the next stage. Uh, 
Uh, that doesn't mean there isn't more layers of packing, and in this case there is more layers of packing, and there's also some anti-analysis. So some of that, by doing the same process of analysis that we've been talking about, allows you to determine whether or not it's packed. So this is just disassembling that unpacked sample and just recognizing that, right, we've got some, again, some strange code that we have to start chugging through. Um, some of the techniques that gets the PEB at FS30 hex, so that's usually an instruction that stands out pretty, uh, you know, it really stands out to me when I'm looking at any binary. Uh, it moves that into EAX, it then moves that into ESI, probably to save it, to use it later. But the important part here is EAX plus two is moved into AL, it's then tested and a conditional jump follows. That offset in the PEB, two hex, right? The PEB is a structure and you can find it somewhat defined on Wikipedia, uh, somewhat defined on MSDN. Uh, that, that member right there is, the, is being debugged flag. So it's just simply detecting or determining based off of that structure in a non-API way, right? There are APIs that Microsoft recommends for detecting this behavior, looking for the is being debugged flag. This isn't it. Um, it's just seeing if it's being debugged. Okay, a little bit later on in the code, whole series of checks. ESI, if you recall, that's our PEB. It's moving an offset of 68 hex into, e, uh, into EAX. It then from there uses EAX plus 10. And what this ends up being is a pointer to the process heap, and if the program is being debugged at an offset of 10 from that process heap, you'll have a value of 70 hex, which is why or where this value here for this bitwise end is coming from. It then tests, and again, if it determines that it is in a debugged environment, it can modify its behavior or just abort program or the program itself. Um, there's one more that Smoke Loader exhibits, uh, at least in the amount of the code that I looked at. Uh, same ESI structure, this happens to be the process heap, this gives us at an offset of 10 hex the force flags. And the force flags is another flag that tells the kernel whether or not that process is being debugged if it was started with a debugger. Right? So several different well-known techniques that are, that are still being used and employed. This one, in addition, uses RC4 encryption. And so what you'll find is that in some of the functions, functions that are going to use strings, you're going to find these sequences of what appears like random data. It looks like a stack string, except that if you convert that data to ASCII, it's not going to convert because it's still encrypted. So one pattern, though, is, is overlaps, and that is the null byte. So CL, if we could see all the code up above, that register was XORed, so we have a null byte to then null terminate this, this buffer of data. And so this process repeats. So anytime that in this code, it needs to deobfuscate or decrypt a string, it's gonna set them up on the stack, and then you'll see this call a little bit later on. And I rename, rename mine decrypt string. Uh, this one took a little bit of analysis to figure out exactly what it was doing, but the gist of it is that it's, uh, apologize, it's a little bit out of sight, um, out of order. That's the function. And I said that there's a little bit of obfuscation first. Right? That's it injected just a ton of junk instructions at the beginning of this function. And that's what the function graph looks like, uh, just one big solid line. So you have to figure out exactly where those junk instructions are and focus on just the functionality. And again, usually you can, you can start to see the patterns, so you know what's junk and what isn't. Um, so this one uh, pushes the size of the string onto the stack so it knows what bytes to decrypt. It then moves a pointer for that string into the stack as well. So into EAX and then push EAX. Uh, we then push a, or move a key into ECX. So it's a hard-coded key and that same key is actually used for every single string that it's encrypted. So it's a, it's a constant key. The function is called and after it's called, there you can see the key, but more importantly, if you look at the pointer to the stack string, it is now in its decrypted form. So with this, because it's using well-known crypto, you could recognize that pattern, probably write a plug-in, go through those stack strings, decrypt them, and add a comment or an annotation in your IDA database to help with your analysis. Jump chains are another problem, and this is another technique that Smoke Loader employs. And here is an example of this problem. Uh, it starts, our programs start at start, not at main. And from here we have a call $5, that just takes us to the next instruction. And these two instructions here, this is the jump chain. You have two conditional jumps, jump if zero, jump if not zero, they're complementary situations, and they're both going to the same location, right? So in this disassembly, you see 40299D plus two. 
because IDA doesn't detect that that's not really two separate conditional jumps, it's really just a single conditional jump, then what will happen is if you put some junk instructions after that, it will continue to disassemble and you'll get incorrect disassembly results. And you can actually see this right here and that we're, we're jumping to this location plus two, but IDA didn't create this location. Right? Here's our label, 40299D, but it's going to plus two and that's because this disassembly was incorrect. So you can manually fix that up. You can convert that back to data and then go to the right location, which is this address plus two, and then go ahead and tell it to disassemble correctly. But that's very tedious and time consuming. So there's some scripts. I have some examples and I'm gonna to link to a few here in just a moment that will go through and essentially identify all of those situations. You can look at the opcodes. So you can look at the actual byte values and say, oh, here's a, here's a short jump, here's a long jump. We see two of them together, so we know that the address, the, you know, the jump target, is actually where we're going. So let's just replace the first instance with an unconditional jump to that location and then knock out the other one. Right? And then your disassembly can look a lot more accurate and it will clean up the code a little bit. Um, so that's one of the techniques in anti-disassembly. The other thing that it's doing then is also making your, your function graphs a little bit harder to generate because you have uh, a jump and then an instruction to another jump and an instruction and then another jump and so you've got these chains of jumps that are just really annoying to look at. So all of this code, if you were to trace through it, is essentially just doing these commands here. So with smoke loader, it does a little bit of jump chains at the beginning, and then you get back into kind of normal functionality. Uh, we'll talk real briefly here because I'm running out of time. Uh, with FinSpy, and FinSpy does it just about through the whole darn um, program. So it's more prevalent and it's a lot more painful to deal with. Uh, for your reference, there's a, a difference between the two, original disassembly, and then, um, oh, actually it looks like the same thing. So I, have a, I had a screenshot apparently, I, I failed to post the right one. Uh, what that looks like after the plugin ran and cleaned up all of those locations. So the plugin was able to go through, read the actual opcodes for all the instructions, and then clean up the entire database for me so that I didn't have to go through and do that one manually, one, one of those jump spots at a time. All right, the last thing uh, is just to discuss a little bit about FinFish or FinSpy. Um, this one I encountered earlier this year, uh, which seemed to coincide with uh, some notable researchers also publishing information about analysis on FinSpy and in particular the use of the virtual machine. So when I first encountered this, I didn't recognize, I'd never encountered a virtual machine, at least used in malware before, and I certainly have never taken the time to reverse engineer the Java virtual machine or anything like that. Um, so it really threw me off because I didn't understand what I was looking at. It took me some time to recognize what it was, and because some of this research happened to come out at the same time, it became very instrumental for me to figure out a little bit better what was going on here. Um, I won't get into FinFish or FinSpy because I don't really know a whole lot about all the data breach and stuff. It's out there, it's on WikiLeaks, uh, it's still being used. It was sold by a German UK company um, as a IT monitoring solution, to put it very politely. Um, and the resources that I found the most helpful in analyzing this, uh, ESET has a white paper with some code so it's an almost 100% solution. There's some gaps that you'd have to fill if you were gonna to try to recreate this work based off of their paper. Uh, Mobius Strip has a site and there is an extensive number of articles there, really great resource. And then uh, Microsoft has also published some technical analysis. So, so three uh, really great sources of information came out earlier this year. So why a virtual machine? It's another layer of obfuscation. So if you take a, a .NET program, for example, it's bytecode, it gets interpreted by the .NET runtime, the CLR, and that bytecode is then interpreted into machine code. So if you took a .NET binary and you disassembled it with, with IDA Pro, you'd be looking at that bytecode and that process of, of however it's being converted um, or some, something that would look pretty awful anyway. Uh, IDA's not the right tool, right? There are tools that will then be able to parse that bytecode and turn it back into decompiled code. So DN spy is an example. It'll, it'll look like the original or more like the original C sharp. Um, this creates a nice layer of obfuscation, and at least for me, one that was pretty effective when I encountered it. Uh, there's a virtual processor that is now built into the program versus having that virtual machine running within the host, so there is a, a distinction there. Um, full of byte codes or virtual instructions that have to be translated through the program into native code in order to get the actual functionality. So in order to understand what the program is doing, at least from that, that static analysis perspective, is you have to understand what those virtual instructions are, how the virtual machine works, so that you can understand how it's translating those into those native code calls. So it's quite a bit of work. 
Uh, those, the processor, the byte code, the, the intermediate code, that can be defined by the developer. So you can find that it'll be easy if they have, of course, the source to build this, something that they can easily tweak so that your, your scripts, your tools that are, that are tackling these problems can change and you have to update those. Um, as well as, of course, there can be a variety of different VM solutions out there, and there are. There are some proprietary ones that, um, that you could take a look at. Okay, so this sample, if you grab a copy, uh, the MD5s I put at the original slide, and you disassemble it, you're going to find that the beginning starts with a bunch of junk instructions. And as you navigate down those junk instructions, you'll find this pattern, which is this push followed by a jump. This jump to this location is actually our entry point. So it's like our, the beginning of our VM. And this push value right here is identifying the virtual instruction. So we're, we're calling the entry point, we're pushing the idea of the, the instruction that we want to call, and that starts the process. Uh, one way you can recognize this, and this is what I was referring to with all these junk instructions. Um, one way you can identify this is by looking at the cross-references to that location. And you can see in this sample here that there are 124 different cross-references to that location. So it's a very heavily used um, point in the program. So uh, my initial assessment was that it was the entry point as well as you can, I, I was able to confirm that with some of that research that was also published. Um, from here, you're going to run into some jump chains. So the first thing that you had to do, that I had to do, was um, you know, really adapt the script that I had made for Smoke Loader and get it to go through this database and try to identify all these sites and really clean up the database. Once I was able to do that, uh, then I was able to create a cleaner call graph. So I could then convert that location to a function and I could toggle from the linear view back to the function call graph view, and I came up with something that looked like this. Uh, we won't have time to go into all the details here, and so we'll just focus on the essentials, and what this is essentially doing is it's preparing what is called the dispatcher. So we're, we're taking a virtual opcode, a virtual instruction, the virtual machine, this entry point then, is going to do some things to prepare this dispatcher to know and process what that instruction is and the code that can handle its interpretation, its execution. So that's all that it's doing. So it's, it's, it's allocating some memory, it's creating a virtual stack for the VM that's going to be running. Uh, with this sample, it did do some encryption, so the instructions had to be XOR decrypted, they were then packed, they had to be unpacked, they were then still encrypted, they had to be decrypted again. So all of this is happening inside of this chunk of code. and. Eventually, once we get to the very end, then it's ready to call the appropriate dispatcher. So that is the, the section of code that's responsible for now interpreting whatever that instruction actually is. Um, ESET had some really good uh, tools available because they did a lot of in-depth work here. So they identified some key structures that are available or that are used throughout this virtual machine. One is the context. So when an instruction is about to be executed, there is a structure, a context structure that's created. And that structure, oh crap, I got ahead of myself. That structure contains important elements, like where does the stack begin, where does the image begin, where, where are the arguments, where is the virtual instruction? Um, and I have it listed here a little bit better later on. Um, at the end of that, that start, that entry point of the virtual machine, you'll find this jump. And this is the actual transition from start to that dispatcher. So at this point, you could set a breakpoint and you could see where this is going. And, and where this is going is essentially a jump table, right? So it did a little bit of analysis there in preparing for the execution of that virtual instruction to load the right location for that handler. So it's just a jump table. Um, This is what the dispatcher looked like, and that last basic block is where that handler will then transfer that control, the, the dispatcher will transfer control to the handler. So what you can do is you can actually add cross-references to those locations. So we had that jump table, the list of those, those, those calls, those jump targets, and you can go in IDA and actually add cross-references to those. You can say, okay, at the end of my dispatcher function, there's actually a cross-reference to this location. And if you do that, then it will make your function graph look like this, right? Which, at least to me, made it look a little bit more obvious as to the fact that there was some sort of a, of a dispatcher routine here. So jump, then this code here is the dispatcher. This handles whatever that virtual instruction was. Uh, as I said, there's still more to go. And there's a context structure that contains 
the pointer to the byte code, the address of the VM stack, uh, the image base, the byte code start address, the virtual instruction parameters, and instead of linking to it here in the, in the slides, uh, ESET has the entire structure documented. So what you can do is grab that structure and then you can create it in IDA and then you can overlay that structure and those offsets into where that's being used in your code. And that'll grab, add more clarity, more visibility into what that program is actually doing. Uh, this VM has 34 handlers, those jump tables, those handlers that we talked about, there's 34 of them. That means there's 34 opcodes. So the next step is to signature what those are doing and then move into the process of actually creating a decompiler. So this was by far for me the most difficult, difficult level of obfuscation that I encountered because there was so many steps involved with it. Um, and the time that I had to devote to this as a project for some work I was doing, uh, this far exceeded that time. So I have a, a, a better understanding of how they work, but again, it's a lot of time involved here. So um, I, I thought a, a relatively effective way of slowing down the research and the analysis. 50 minutes. So that's all my time. Uh, I appreciate everybody uh, spending the last 50 minutes with me talking a little bit about malware and obfuscation. Uh, again, any questions, comments, uh, anything I said wrong you want to correct me on, please feel free to email me, jstroshine at vdalabs.com. And uh, hopefully everyone has a great TorCon. So thank you. Thank you.